saying that gold or silver never performs. I read comments all the time that says, when is gold going to move? To which my answer is, let me think. I think gold's going to move in the year 2000. Since 2000, gold has moved from $253 an ounce to a high of 27 something, currently around 26. What is that, a sevenfold return? Gold has done eight and change compounded annually for 24 years. And some moron says, when is gold going to move? It always fails. That person is enumerate. Uh, mercifully for me, people who are probably smarter than me that don't apply their brains to the task at hand lose money while I make money. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially. My name is Kai Hoff and I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy over on X and of course your host of this channel. And I'm looking forward to welcoming back an old friend of the channel, Rick Rule of Rule Investment Media. Supposed to be retired, but busier than ever. It's unbelievable. I hope you have his stamina when I get, when I get there. And it's unbelievable. I have a lot of respect, but uh, we have lots to talk about. We last spoke about five, six months ago, and uh, we, we called, or no, sorry, I titled the video, Goal to Scary Move to $9,000. Got a lot of flack for the title, of course, but the, the momentum and the tra tra trajectory and the direction of the gold price was intact, though. We hit 27.50 and uh, gold has been trading higher ever since our conversation. It hasn't really come down to the level of our discussion. Of course, we got lots of macro factors to discuss and if, th does Trump impact gold price at all? So I'm gonna ask uh, my, my guest about that. Next steps, how is he handling sentiment in the junior mining space or in the mining sector in general? We've seen a lot of euphoria in the fall. It seems to have disappeared. So I'm curious what my guest thinks. Is this a buying the dip opportunity? So. Without uh, you know further ado, I'll, I will switch over to my guest in one short second. You have to hit that subscribe button first. It's a free way to support us, and we do appreciate it. Now, Rick, it is great to have you back on the channel. It's good to see you again. Kai, it's a pleasure to be back with you. Thank you for having me back. I enjoy having discussions with you in front of your audience. Thank you. No, I appreciate that, Rick. And uh, let, let's dive right in. Let's, dive, let's start with a bit of an icebreaker, and let's get our audience riled up a little bit. And uh, the question is, did Trump destroy the gold price and the gold miners along with it? Uh, did Trump do it? No. Uh, I think what Trump did is he made financial markets uh, bullish on the U.S. dollar. You will notice that gold is still doing well in any currency in the world with the exception of doing well against the U.S. dollar. Uh, a strong dollar uh, in the near term probably wasn't good for gold because it's priced in U.S. dollar terms. I don't think that there's anything that Trump can do uh, during his presidency that will derail the gold thesis. Uh, I would caution people that the gold thesis is a long-term thesis. And the idea that people judge gold or, go or judge their gold portfolio in four week or five week or six weeks sequences is silly, but that's what markets do. That's why I suggest, that's why I exist, by the way. That's why I thrive because I think differently. Do you have a bit of schadenfreude? And uh, let, let me elaborate on that, what I mean by that. So schadenfreude is like, and I love reading the comments. Uh, by the way, it's like I read almost every comment below the YouTube videos. I'm not sure it's good for my mental health, but I do. Um, and one of the comments below or one of the last videos was, I dislike gold and silver YouTube videos, always crying wolves. And uh, and it crashes again, it being the gold price, always wrong, yawn, right? Did, did you get a bit of schadenfreude when gold is trading around $2,600? We're up 2% as we record this. It's like, is there a bit of sense of like, yes, showed you, like I told you so? I'm delighted that you pronounced the word, by the way, as opposed to me. <laughs> um, you know, I read the YouTube comments too. Uh, I pay a lot of attention to sentiment. And I try to do the opposite of what is suggested by the sentiment. When I used to own a brokerage firm, uh, I used to count the number of buy tickets every day and the number of sell tickets every day. And any day where the buy tickets uh, outnumbered the sell tickets more than four to one, I would make myself buy something, the uh, sell something the next day. Any day where the sell tickets overwhelmed the buy tickets four to one, I'd try to buy something the next day. So I'm really, really attracted to negative social media uh, discussions of any one topic. The lady or the gentleman who posted yawned, saying that gold or silver never performs. I read comments all the time that says, when is gold gonna move? To which my answer is, 
let me think. I think gold's going to move in the year 2000. Since 2000, gold has moved from $253 an ounce to a high of 27 something, currently around 26. What is that, a sevenfold return? Gold has done eight and change compounded annually for 24 years. And some moron says, when is gold going to move? It always fails. That person is enumerate. Uh, mercifully for me, people who are probably smarter than me that don't apply their brains to the task at hand lose money while I make money. We sell gold and silver, but we're also, and most importantly, we're in the credibility and trust business. We do everything we say we're gonna do. We ship timely, we communicate well. It's a nerve wracking process for many folks, especially the first time they're investing in precious metals. And it's a big goal of ours to make folks comfortable when they're making this kind of investment and making this kind of decision for themselves. Money Metals offers all of the offerings that somebody interested in precious metals needs. We provide great pricing, fast delivery. We have a fully integrated storage offering. We provide a loan program for people that want to borrow against their gold and silver for business purposes. We have a monthly purchase plan that allows people to put their investing on autopilot. We advocate for gold and silver public policy around the country. We're the only ones doing that. We're advocating for our customers because we believe in our product and we are aligned with our customers. We are the most prolific publisher of precious metals content in our industry. We are a one-stop shop for precious metals, all under one roof. Very good points. Absolutely. Like I, I see those comments as well. Oh, what has gold done for me lately? Right. And uh, that's uh, that's a hilarious one, especially when gold is trading at twenty seven fifty. And one thing that always like it, it amazes me a little bit is like we've Rob McCune, I think, was the most vocal about a three thousand dollar gold price or a gold price target. And uh, he, he's gotten so much flack over the years for it. And then the, the big banks come out with higher gold price targets as well, sort of validating his thesis as well, that he's been he hasn't changed at all, like despite lots of blowback in, in the capital markets for that. Like, what, what do you make that? It's like, is it easy to stand your ground? Is it easy to sway? Um, like sort of that thesis of $3,000? Yes, it's a higher target. But uh, it, it doesn't really change the narrative, does it? Kai, I'm not a politician. <laughs> well, I'm not narrative oriented. I'm a credit analyst which means that I'm arithmetically oriented. Uh, that means that people are bored by my answers, uh, but I'll answer anyway. The, the truth is, and I'm, I'm gonna make a US centric remark, not a European centric remark. I suspect your problems are worse. Uh, I've made it before, but I'll make it again because it's central to the thesis. The on balance sheet liabilities of the US government are $36 trillion. The off balance sheet liabilities are estimated to be $100 trillion. You add those two numbers together and you subtract the Fed's balance sheet. And it means that the recourse liabilities of the United States government exceed $130 trillion. The Internal Revenue Service suggests that the net private wealth in the United States is $141 trillion. $141 trillion, which is what we're, what we're worth privately, subtracting $130 trillion, which is what we owe collectively, is not pretty arithmetic. Look at it differently, or perhaps the same way. The increase in liability, both on balance sheet and off balance sheet, uh, appears to be about four or five trillion dollars per year. That isn't just the on balance sheet deficit. It includes the accretion of unfunded liability like Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. The gross federal revenues before any expenditures are that same number, which is to say the deficit incre increases by the amount of gross federal revenue that we have. This debt is unsustainable, and dealing with the debt is politically unfeasible. Now, we dealt with this as a people before, although the problem was less severe. In the decade of the 1970s, politically, we couldn't raise taxes. 
but we had to pay for deficits and we had to account for the debt brought up in the war in Vietnam, which of course we lost, and the war on poverty, which of course we lost. How did we do that? Well, in the decade of the 70s, according to the US government, through inflation, we reduced the purchasing power of the US dollar by 75% over 10 years. Not coincidentally, the gold price went from $35 to $850. The only way, the only way that we can service the nominal debt that we have as a people, particularly our entitlements obligation, is to inflate away the net present value of the obligation while leaving the nominal value intact. An old geezer named Rick Rule, 71 years old. I don't know what Social Security pays me, but let's say it's 4,000 bucks. You know, I was a high income taxpayer. 10 years from now, they'll still pay me that nominal amount. They won't reduce it, although they can't afford to pay it. What they will do is they will inflate away the net present value of that nominal account. So my $4,000 will buy me six or $700, maybe $1,000 worth of goods and services. That's how you deal with that sort of thing. You either default honestly, uh, you say to the bondholders and you say to the entitlement holders, too bad, so sad, money's all gone, strong letter to follow, or you default gradually by inflating away the net present value of the purchasing power. My suspicion is passes prologue and we take door B, which is very good for gold. Gold in 2024, who knows? Gold in 2025, who knows? Look over 10 years. If you look back to the decade of the 70s, it'll tell you something about their tra trajectory. 1970 to, uh, to 1972, gold went from being controlled to decontrolled, so it was $35 to $100. 74, gold went on a tear from 100 to $200, doubled. 1975, the Fed raised the interest rates. Gold fell from 200 to 100. End of 1975, the Fed lost their nerve politically, cut the interest rate. And that set off a romp at the end of 1975 that saw gold go to $850. Last in this case is prologue. Gold will go up and down, higher bottoms, higher tops. People who don't understand the process will be shaken out uh, when gold softens up. By the way, Decline from $2,700 to $2,600. That's a rounding error. It's truly, truly a rounding error. Uh, 1975, the gold price fell from 200 bucks to 100 bucks. That's a fall. People who got shaken out in 1975 missed a five year run from a $100 bottom to an $850 top. Folks need to give their head a shake. No, absolutely. It was a 7% 7, 7 drop, I think, so far that we've seen, and it's recovering nicely already uh, as we speak right Speaking now. Speaking of a yawn, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. I'll, I'll see if I can make my questions more interesting, Rick. But, uh, you know, just looking at short-term markets, I'm just looking at the bond yields for the 10-year, for example. Do, do you look at the Treasury yields? Is it telling you something right now? Is that, I'm just trying to pick up on some trends here that we might be seeing. What, what is odd, I've seen this twice before in my life, and by the way, I'm a credit guy. I'm not an economist. So take it from a credit guy. What is very unusual is that the overnight funds rate, the Fed rate fell, and the market took up the long bond rate. You don't see that very often. You know, they say, don't fight the tape, don't fight the Fed. When you see the cost of funds fall, and then you see the 10-year rise, it tells you that the market is thinking something is not right with rates. We haven't talked about the bond vigilante since the second year of the Clinton administration. But the fact that the cost of funds for the big institutions goes down and the yield demanded on the 10 year goes up tells you all is not right in Fedland. Yeah, duration risk is uh, is coming at a premium now. And uh, 
that 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 is being priced in. We we need to get Ed Yardeni on as well because he's the person who uh, who coined the phrase Bond vigilantes back in the eighties, and we've had him on the channel about a year ago. So I need to bring him back on just to see what the latest move is because it seems like the the Bond. I think uh, you know there's there's a lot of instability uh, in debt markets in credit markets, and there ought to be. Yeah, the, in, the in, lack of interest from foreign buyers is one. And uh, having to refinance in 2025, I think, uh, could could cause a liquidity crisis. What are your thoughts on that coming from the credit side? Are, are you worried about a liqu liquidity crisis in the short term here? Uh, I, I don't think in the short term. Uh, so who knows? So next 12 months, 12, 18 months, do you think? Because a lot of bonds here's and the, bills are due. Here's my problem. Well, two problems, really. Uh, interest in credit markets is predicated on the fact the market itself believes in the CPI, the rate of inflation that people take into account is the rate of the rate of inflation that is given them by the U.S. government. Uh, and I prefer to term the CPI to be the CP lie. But first of all, when it's inconvenient, it doesn't include food or fuel. I like to eat, Kai. Uh, any inflation index that doesn't include lunch is of no use to me. But more importantly, the CPI doesn't include the cost of government. If I didn't pay tax, I wouldn't bitch about the index. I believe that currently the deterioration of the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar is closer to 7.5% than 2.6%. I would invite your listeners to look at a basket of goods and services that they consume and take themselves back to, say, the year 2000. What's happened to the price of gasoline? What's happened to the price if they depending on where they live, uh, to health insurance? What's happened to a basket of groceries? What's happened to their direct and indirect tax? The idea that people around the world, but particularly in the US, have been experiencing deterioration of their purchasing power at 2.6% a year is insane. It's untrue. It's widely believed, but it's a fallacy. If you are a traditional bond buyer and you hold the U.S. 10-year treasury and you're getting 4.6%, your real yield, if I'm right, is a minus 3%. You're getting 4.6 in a currency that's depreciating at 7.5. The market and the U.S. government are absolutely positively guaranteeing you that if you lend money to the U.S. government for three years, you are going to be 3% less wealthy every year for 10 years. Jim Grant calls that return free risk. Now that is a concern in the credit market. If we ever had real interest rates, think about a, a risk premium to the underlying rate of inflation. Uh, that would be ugly. I have a second credit concern since you asked the question. Now we're <laughs> Now we're in a talk. Uh, now we're in a, a topic I can talk to. I'm not a politician. I'm not an economics professor. You know, I'm a greed eye shade guy. <laughs> the thing that scares me the most in terms of liquidity is the corporate junk bond market, and in particular, high yield ETFs. You have trillions of dollars invested in high yield ETFs. Uh, from investors who are chasing yields but don't know anything about the credit quality of the underlying credits. And while the ETFs themselves trade like water, the constituents to the ETFs, the high yield bonds, the so-called junk bonds, are often extremely illiquid. If we have a circumstance, I'm not saying we will, I'm not saying we won't, but if we have a circumstance where uh, an increasing rate of corporate bankruptcy, which we're beginning to see, makes uh, the average American concerned about credit quality and those Americans just begin to liquidate their ETFs. The difficulty is that the managers of those ETFs have to sell the underlying bonds to fund the redemptions and the underlying bonds are very, very illiquid. Uh, I think I've used this quip on your show before, Kai. But that leads to a circulation where you, to a situation, pardon me, where you have an asset class called owl bonds. An owl bond is where you call your broker and tell them to sell 
and they say to who <laughs> no i don't think you've used that before rick well it's truly scary uh, i remember the collapse in credit markets that occurred in 2008 when people came to understand uh the nature of real estate secured junk debt and my fear uh now is twofold uh first of all nominal interest rates are actually negative and the underlying credit quality in the junk bonds uh, is insufficient, I think, to sustain the yields over time. Uh, this, I'm not saying it will, but this could have the impact of a run in the bank with no treasury backing. What I'm trying to figure out, it's timing is always difficult, Rick. Don't get me wrong. Like, I'm not asking for exact dates. I'm just trying to figure out, like, where, where is the tipping point? Like, I've just shown the chart. Let me bring it back up here real quick. Just corporate bankruptcies in the U.S., right? Um, just bankruptcies. It, it is ticking up, but we're nowhere near, like, a 1980s level um, in terms of bankruptcies of companies. Yes, the, the trend is seemingly intact, and it's turning around. Um now that we're here in 2023, 2024, uh, as per the chart. But uh, like, wh where's the tipping point? Like, wh when do you think this will be hit? And I'm not talking about the exact number of US bankruptcies. That was just a, a, a backup chart here. But I'm curious what your thoughts are. The answer to your question is I have no earthly idea. But looking at the chart, uh, let's look at the period 2007, 2008. Uh, when the chart turns against you, it turns against you rapidly in an extraordinarily ugly fashion. Are we there yet? I don't know. You don't know? Nobody knows. <clears throat> What's the price of being right? Uh, the junk bond indexes yield about 200 basis points more, 250 basis points more than two-year treasuries. Why would you take that level of credit risk for 250 basis points? Uh, this has been described in prior conversations as picking up nickels in front of a steam shovel. Um, I have zero, I, zero. I'll tell you, this really reminds me of, a, of an episode earlier in my life, Kai. I was driving up the 405 freeway in Southern California on my way from San Francisco to LA airport, for those of you who aren't familiar. Uh, and on the right side of the freeway, there was a great big billboard. And it said, uh, borrow 125% of the value of your home. Bad credit, okay. Now, I wasn't a real estate guy, uh, but I am a lender. And I remember looking at that sign saying, I don't like the sound of this. Uh, did I put two and two together and anticipate a collapse in the real estate bond market or in the banking market? Unfortunately, no. But the signs were on the wall. That credit condition, uh, great big lenders, by the way, that was General Motors who later went bankrupt. <laughs> or, yeah, General Motors Credit that was doing that. Um, that condition, uh, which is to say excess liquidity and excess faith in a sector where the arithmetic was bad, but where the 20 year track record was good, exists today. And the writing, uh, uh, I think, well, less clear is pretty clear. Did anybody care in 2006? Some people did. And you know what they were saying? When is it going to change? Who knows? What's the, what's the reward for being right? And what's the penalty for being wrong? That's what people have to ask themselves. If you ask yourself a question where the answer begins with when, you're asking yourself a very good question. If you're asking yourself a question where the answer begins with if, that's not such a good question. Yeah, it reminds me of the saying, like, the market can stay irrelevant or, uh, was it, uh, uh, longer than you can stay solvent, right? Yeah, and the truth is, at 71 years old, uh, I've proven that to be wrong. Hmm. Uh, sometimes it's taken me four years or five years to be right. Hmm. Uh, but the truth is, uh, I was about 30 when I learned the contrarian lesson. And I learned the c contrarian lesson by taking what was an awful lot of money for a young guy and losing it all. Uh, since then, I've been wrong in terms of time, but still wrong in terms of direction. Uh, and my life has gotten, in every regard, better. 
I sleep nights and stay calm. And I got to be old and fat and bald and rich, which is a wonderful circumstance. I mean, not as good as young and fit and pretty and rich, but. <laughs> Can't have everything, Rick. Can't have everything, you know. Um, but since you keep bringing up your age, I'm, I'm going to throw that into the question here. Um, at, at, at your age, at 71, where would bond yields have to be for you to be of interest? Uh, Risk-free bonds. Yeah, let's let's say the 10-year, just for... Uh, the 10 year where I'm taking duration risk, uh, I would have to get 250 or 300 or 300 basis points over the overall deterioration rate in the U.S. dollar. In other words, I have to get a 250 or 300 basis point real yield, <clears throat> which means uh, what 250 basis points on top of seven and a half. The 10 would have to be yielding 10, <laughs> and if the 10 yielded 10. Uh, one could assume that the 30-year fixed mortgage would be at a 300% 300 basis point premium to that, which is to say that the 30-year fixed rate mortgage would have to go from 7.1 to 13. I'm a, a long buy, a long way from being a long duration buyer. I think everybody is or should be right now, just based on common sense. I think we're done with 60-40 anyway. Um, like, I'm not sure what kind of role bonds should play as, as part of a portfolio. I'm not a financial advisor here, and everybody's case is specific, but it shouldn't be as high as it was in the past. That that ship has sailed. And Would you underwrite that? Yep. The big institutional investors, uh, their analysis seems to be rear looking. The lessons they learned, I think they learned in the period 1982 to 2022, which were the most benign economic climate in human history. Uh, we had 40 years of declining bond rates, and we had uh, 40 years of increasing government debt. And I'm afraid that uh, those lines are going to cross the wrong way for folks. Oh, absolutely. Um, Rick, I lo I'm loving the credit discussion we're having. It's, it's a bit more specific than just talking general mining, and we'll, we'll get to some of the mining questions here in a second. But from, from a credit perspective, is the U.S. dollar still trustworthy, and is that uh, still a currency you would put your trust in then? Yeah, I mean, the U.S. dollar is the worst currency in the world, as Doug Casey would say, except all the others. <laughs> uh, Doug is – have you ever interviewed Doug, by the way? Uh, just last week or 10 days ago. Yeah, yeah I mean, he's just great. He's, he's the best. Uh, alarmist, <laughs> but he's better at narrative than I, so he's more fun to interview. <laughs> Let's let's get back to your question. Doug described the U.S. dollar as an IOU nothing. He described the euro, which has what 15, 16 countries, hmm. as a who owes you nothing. And I would suggest that the BRICS, uh, a bunch of countries with inconvertible currencies who don't like or trust each other, is a nobody owes you anything. So in that league, uh, the U.S. dollar is pretty strong. I save and insure in gold. I maintain my liquidity in US dollars. And I invest in companies. That's sort of how I look at it. I have a lot of US dollars right now, because I have more liquidity than I would like to have, which is really a consequence of the fact that uh, I'm like Buffett, sadly, to a different degree, <laughs> opportunity constrained. Oh, that's that's a layup there, Rick. I, I got to ask. I got to follow that up. And uh, we, we, now we have to switch to the mining markets. We just have to. And the question is, like, why are you in, in cash rich? Because Buffett sold a lot of stocks. So the question is, have you used a moment of euphoria the last six, seven weeks um, until like the last Fed meeting here to, to offload some of your positions? Yes. Yeah. I mean... Those that were my trading positions. You'll recall, Kai, that last November, de December, uh, I said that the junior silver stocks were coiled springs. Hmm. Not because I thought the silver price was going to go up, but because they were so widely hated. <laughs> uh, the people who were involved in the so called silver squeeze, the Reddit silver crowd, thought that silver was going to go to 200 bucks owned the hell out of these silver juniors. When so when silver went up, went down as opposed to up, they hated everything that was silver related and everybody who could possibly sell had already sold. 
So I bought a lot of them. Uh, then they were up 250%, 300%. What does a guy do in a circumstance like that? They were no longer hated. They weren't cheap. So I did a lot of selling. Uh, we had a circumstance very recently, three or four weeks ago, where the uranium stocks were already sold, gapped up because of artificial intelligence. This is something that's going to impact the uranium market seven years from now, but not seven weeks from now. Hmm. So you had a couple junior uranium stocks that I thought were okay, but they were up 40% in price for reasons that I knew didn't matter on a net present value basis. So I sold. I had a lot of liquidity coming in this year because I looked at junior mining companies' balance sheets and income statements, and there were some companies that I really liked that I thought would have to finance this year. And I thought that there wouldn't be any buyers. I was right in the first assumption and I was wrong in the second assumption. For high quality companies, there were a lot of buyers. And most of the private placements that I looked at weren't attractive to me. They didn't include warrants. I can't blame the issuer uh, if the market is stupid enough to take exploration risk without a warrant, uh, the issuer is under an obligation to accommodate the investor's stupidity. But I didn't need to be that stupid. <laughs> so the consequence is that all of the money that I had set aside to participate in private placements uh, is having to find its way into the general uh, free trading market. And I have to do that gently. I was going to say volumes are still fairly down, especially now they've dropped off again. And uh, there's a lot of like, what, what do you call it? Like, once, ignorance is the wrong word. I'm trying to just like hesitation. Hesitation, I think, is the right word right now, especially after the U.S. election. The Fed stepped on the brakes. As I said, it's like sentiment after Beaver Creek was phenomenal. Silver companies, for example, have been like bombarded with cash. Like they, they drowned in capital. Like I spoke to one company trying to raise eight million. They could have taken orders for fifty million if they wanted to. Absolutely insane. But that's disappeared. That has completely disappeared. And uh, not not sure where I'm going with this question, but it's like. Like, will that return? Like, what? why has it disappeared? Maybe is the right question. Like, why did we step on the euphoria break here just uh, the second it started again? I think it was unsustainable. Uh, people paid attention to momentum. They didn't invest in these companies because they had any sense of the risk-adjusted net present value of a drilling program. They bought stocks because they were going up. Can you imagine something more stupid than that? Um... <laughs> Can you imagine walking into a store and you're shopping for a pound of butter and you think a pound of butter, how much is a pound of butter? I don't know, two bucks, something like that. Uh, and five, five. Okay. So you see a price, you, you see a sign in the store. I'm sorry. Uh, butter, formerly $5 now six and a half. And so because it's up in a buck and a half, you buy seven pounds. I mean, this is incredibly stupid. Uh, unless the value of a company has increased, the fact that the share price goes up makes it, as an investor, less arithmetically attractive. If it goes down, assuming that the value hasn't gone down, it makes it more arithmetically attractive. And this is the single toughest idea that I have to sell. When people buy physical goods, they're often very good shoppers. They shop on sale. When people buy financial goods, they're astonishingly stupid. I guess I should just sit back and enjoy that. I mentioned silver for for a particular reason because silver broke out on a technical level. Like everybody talked about thirty two fifty. I'm not a technical analyst, so I'm just like sort of parroting what what others have been saying. But silver broke out, and that's when sort of the floodgates opened. I think they were chasing a momentum, but also chasing beta. Like they were chasing the underlying, uh, the underlying like trying to profit from a silver trade. Everybody said, okay, once we break thirty two fifty, we're gonna race up to fifty. Like, we don't have to talk about the narrative and, like, how potentially stupid that call was. But uh, 
is is that so different than chasing fundamentals like yes the stock is going up for various reasons i'm just trying to understand like the difference between because the company hasn't changed but we're chasing the, the underlying beta we're trying to participate in a rising silver price ideally leveraged through mining stocks potentially if you think the silver price is going to go up you should buy silver uh, understand uh, all of the profligacy that i accuse governments of issuing phony currency the canadian dealer market is much more efficient. They will issue phony share certificates faster than the government issue dollars. You talked about the correlation uh, between a tiny increase in the silver price and the fact that a silver mining company went, to went out to raise $8 million and came back with 50. That's called inflation. The underlying value of the silver company went up by seven tenths of nothing. And the offering went from 7 million to 50. These guys, can dilute their equity even faster than the government can issue phony dollars. And you always need to pay attention to that. There is a huge dichotomy between the way people invest and speculate based on narrative and the way they trade. The strategy is long-term, the tactic is short-term. The implications of that are that a short-term tactic in pursuit of a long-term long strategy will almost always, almost always result in failure. The audience that uh, <laughs> got an erection uh, about an increase in the silver price over $32 uh, needs to give their head a shake. When you go into a silver bull market, you won't be concerned about dollar moves or dollar and a half moves. Uh, and you won't need some old crank named Rick Rule to tell you uh, when you have a silver market, and by the way, it's when, uh, the market will be absolutely positively dramatic. And if you aren't prepared for it, Maybe early, maybe two years early. Uh, the best part of the move, you'll lose. <clears throat> when I look back uh, to my recent Silver Junior trade, I had no idea where the silver price was going to go. I just knew that you had a sector that was extraordinarily volatile that had no sellers left. <laughs> uh, the predominance of questions that were asked uh, of me uh, were despondent about the silver market. All of the social media discussion was despondent about the silver market. High quality silver issuers, uh, juniors, uh, weren't getting funded, which is to say the momentum was terrible. Well, of course the price is gonna go up. If all the sellers have been exhausted, it doesn't take much of a buyer to drive the price. Now, nine months later, uh, the prices are up 300%. Uh, guys go tell the same story at Beaver Creek that they told last year. And as opposed to taking seven, they're offered 60. What does that tell you, Kai? That there's too much money around chasing too little. But uh, just, just just to clarify, the company didn't take 50. They were okay. they could have taken up to you get 50. The point. I absolutely do. So I'm going to turn this around now, maybe some advice for corporate listeners out there. Like, if there's money on the table, should you take it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Dumb money deserves a home. <laughs> or, like they used to say on House Street, when the ducks quack, feed them. Yeah. This is a capital-intensive business. You don't take it when you need it. Uh, otherwise, you have to come to me. You take it when you can. Loan sharking is illegal, isn't it, Rick? No. <laughs> no, just kidding. Usury, usury is illegal. <laughs> no, it, interesting. Like, uh, is is it a buy the dip moment right now? Is it like, are we in a buy the dip phase? Like, I know it's like I'm trying to use a term that uh, has been coined during the COVID crashes and the COVID COVID meme stocks. But uh, like, should we consider looking at dips in, in general, like at gold, silver, even in the mining stocks? Is this is this an opportunity right now? Like, where, how how would you sort of like I think bracket it? Importantly. Uh, you need to construct a buy list 
remember that 95% of the junior stocks in the world are valueless. At any price, if they have a bid, they're overpriced. So 5%, maybe 10 are relevant. What people need to do is construct a list of companies that they think are relevant and they need to form an opinion as to what they're worth or what they might be worth in the right set of circumstances, a set of circumstances that they consider likely. They need to ask themselves, what is a reasonable amount of time for that to occur? What is the probability for it to occur? And then price becomes an issue. The fact that you know the price of something, let's say it's 50 cents bid, but you have no opinion of the value means that the price information that you have is completely and totally irrelevant. Money is made on the delta between price and value. And if you don't have an opinion as to value, the price information isn't worth anything. Now, for me, I have a fairly well-established uh, uh, shopping list. Uh, and to the extent that I'm able to buy positions in companies that are selling at a substantial discount to, think, to what I think they're worth or what I think they might be worth in a set of uh, uh, assumptions that's probabilistic, I buy them. And I am doing a lot more buying right now than selling. Uh, because as you suggest, volumes are very skinny. I don't want to compete with myself. <laughs> so I'm being a fairly judicious uh, buyer. I'm also, unlike what I used to tell your listeners three years ago, I'm buying the small stocks more than the big stocks. The reason is that three years ago, I bought the big stocks. Uh, so I don't have to buy them now. You know, that part of my portfolio is full. Most people should start with the big stocks. I already started with the big stocks. So when people say, well, Rick, you suggest that we buy the big stocks, but you're buying the small stocks. That's because I already bought the big stocks. If you were to, question popped in, but if you were to invest a million dollars right now, you'd have to divide between royalty companies, big stocks, and juniors. How, how would you diversify right now? Depends on who I was and what I knew. Uh, right right now, as, as of this moment, the person you me? are right now. Yeah, For just me? right now. I'd be in the juniors. It's just all juniors? Uh, because I own boatloads of the royalty stocks. Huh. Uh, and I own reasonable allocations of the high quality producers, the Agnico Eagles of the world. So for me, because I work hard, because I have access to information, I'd buy the juniors. For most people, people who aren't Rick Rule, people who have lives, you know, uh, hobbies, jobs, kids, stuff like that, uh, they need to buy Franco Nevada, Wheaton Precious, Agnico Eagle, maybe come down into the quality uh, intermediates, uh, you know, the Alamoses of the world, God knows they've run. The Lundin Golds, God knows they've run. That's most people. That's not me. I've been there, done that. You know, I'm full of that stuff. They've treated me really, really, really well. Uh, I don't need more beta in my portfolio. I've got lots of it. I mean, if you're asking me personally, Kai, in a sense, I'm stupid to buy any of this crap. Uh, I own almost 10% of Sprott. If the gold price goes up, and if the gold stocks do well, Sprott's a brand name for financial services and precious metals. Uh, if a financial planner looked at my portfolio and says, well, Rick, you own 10% of Sprott. You know, you own 10% of a company with $33 billion in assets under administration. If we go into a bull market, the assets under administration will triple. God knows what the cash flow will do. Why do you bother with any of this stuff? That's a really valid question except for it amuses me. <laughs> now, like we all get the question, like what, what does Rick buy? What does he own? And I think people would almost kill to get a view at, uh, take a look at your portfolio. Not the values, they don't really care, but what is in there, right? Some of them just follow blindly and like, I don't think they should personally, like you shouldn't follow yeah. anybody blindly, but, but I, mean, I think how, people would be really interested. Kai, how many people do you know that work as hard as this old, fat, bald, 71-year-old works. Uh, how many people uh, can take, can anticipate uh, taking a 30 or 35% risk on a speculative position? I assume that most of my speculations will lose me money. 
I understand that a 10 bagger amortizes a hell of a lot of 25% declines, but I have both the financial and the psychological wherewithal to stand that. Most people, although they should, don't. Uh, and that ought to drive the way they allocate capital. No, absolutely. Like I've got a thick skin of investing 15 years in junior mining, so I, I can deal with some of the, the, the hits. Not not all of them, but some of them. Rick, I got two more topics I quickly want to tackle with you. One, of course, sort of, sort of circling back to the very first topic we've touched on, and but it's more like looking at commodities that we have that are being forgotten as part of the maybe the election outcome in the U.S. Like, what what are some forgotten commodities that we should be considering that nobody's really talking about that uh, might be worth a closer look? North American natural gas, uh, insanely cheap, probably stays cheap for a while. People will always say when, and I will always say, who cares? Um, North American natural gas is stupidly, stupidly, stupidly cheap. Probably stays cheap for another year and a half. But that's where I'd start. Hated, spectacular business. Um, Very high quality deposits, irrespective of commodities, are usually underpriced relative to other deposits. And potential tier one deposits and commodities that are out of favor are really the way you make 10 baggers or 15 baggers. Uh, so look for potential tier one deposits and commodities that are out of favor. What commodities are out of favor? Nickel, cobalt, platinum and palladium, rare earths, so don't go to the me too names you know don't go to the junk names go to the explorers which are out of favor go to company countries if you have the ability to do it that are out of favor in commodities that are out of favor uh sulfide nickel is too cheap uh, it's too cheap because laterit lateritic nickels are kicking sulfide's ass. Right now, uh, they are cutting sulfide nickel production around the world at the same time that the cost of producing lateritic nickel uh, because of environmental standards are increasing. Uh, is this going to matter next year? Probably not. Uh, will it matter three years out? Absolutely. Another great example is lithium. Oh, I was, I, was, I was going to do that. Yeah. Lithium was, you know, the flavor of the month. People put billions of dollars into lithium. The lithium price went up, what, sixfold? Despite the fact that there wasn't a shortage of lithium. There was a shortage of lithium processing capacity. They deal with the shortage of lithium prospecting, uh, pardon me, processing capacity. The price of lithium falls by 75%, and all this money got stranded. Hmm. Now... There's been a bit of a turnaround in lithium as a consequence of a couple takeovers, but there's still probably 150 projects out there. Probably only five or six of them are production worthy. But my suspicion is over the next 18 months, lithium comes to enjoy the same favor that uranium did when its price fell to $20 a pound. And by the way, I think that lithium may develop a term market just like uranium has. So I suspect if we're having a discussion, Kai, in 2026, 2027, which I hope we do, uh, that the subject that garners the most hate on social media will be lithium. And if that occurs, you will see your old fat friend uh, filling his boots with lithium. Uh, I like stuff that bores people, and I like countries that are hated. So right now, Africa is really hated. So I'm attracted to Africa. Uh, right now, stuff like rare earths are hated. They've underperformed. So I'm attracted to rare earths. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that helps you. I don't want to name names. There's no, I don't have to. But, three or uh... four names that meet that des description that I'm in the market on. And I would hate to be competing with 100,000 Kai Hoffman listeners. <laughs> Get your position first. That's how we do it. But uh, are, are you the secret buyer in Lyft? No. No. <laughs> Just There's no secret buyer. Lyft, Lyft signed a deal, which was publicly disclosed, with Marin Katusa. The $21 million uh, flow-through financing? 
No, well, he signed a financial public relations agreement. Oh, that one, the the million dollar one. No, 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 that that one I knew wasn't you. Like, no, no, but uh, they they've got a secret investor in for twenty one million dollars. Yeah, I, I have no idea. Who okay, that is. But, you know, okay. <laughs> uh, Marin is absolutely, truly amazing at, at distributing a narrative, and I suspect that anybody who wants to speculate and lift looks at the possibility that there might be more buyers than sellers. A uh, high quality guy runs that company, and it's a high quality deposit. Uh, I think they're fighting the tide on lithium, but that's a different question. Yeah, I didn't want to get into the specific stock, uh, specific stock name here and discuss it in particular, but there was a secret buyer and it sort of fit with your your, your narrative. But it I might mean, have been almost 12 months too early for you. So, Yep. yep. No. Um, very last question. Where did I have it? Oh, New Orleans Conference. Our good friend Brian London is hosting the New Orleans Conference this week as well. It's clashing with our conference, but he's a good friend. I love his event, but you're you're attending, you're giving a presentation as well. And I was going to ask you, what what is going to be the main takeaway from your presentation? Uh, it's what, a bit of a replay of my Beaver Creek talk, which was open for business, hmm. where I talk about the fact that my checkbook is open and ready to deploy. And I talk about how issuers might separate me from my money. Uh, and, and I talk about the decision-making process that goes into that uh, and how investors might enjoy better outcomes if their processes were more like mine, or if at least they had a process. That would help. A lot of people need some help in that regard. That's one of the missions of our Deutsche Goldmesse as well. I hope you can attend one of these days, Rick. But uh, we, our main goal is to educate. Yes, we have companies attend and trying to pitch to investors, but I want investors to learn more about our sector. That's so important. I, I look forward to that. You, uh, you always seem to have it during a time that's inconvenient. It's I know. It's like, <laughs> we'll figure it out one of these days. Maybe we'll just plan an event around your 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 calendar next time. So, um, but I'd love to have you one of these days, Rick. Um, do you still rank portfolios? Do you still offer I that do. service, Rick? Like, how can we get a hold of that? How can we reach you there? Uh, any of your listeners who are amused or interested by what I had to say uh, and want to personalize it can go to my website, ruleinvestmentmedia.com. Once there, list your natural resource stocks. No pot stocks, no crypto, no tech stocks. And I personally will rank your portfolio. No charge, no obligation. I'll rank it one to 10, one being best, 10 being worst. And I'll comment on individual issues if I think my comments have any value. Once again, ruleinvestmentmedia.com. List your natural resource. By the way, please be patient. I'm about to go to New Orleans, which means my responses will be six or seven days delayed. Fantastic. Rick, tremendous conversation. A bit different than our other, other usual conversations. So I tremendously appreciate it. Thanks so much for joining us here again on SOAR Financially. Really appreciate it. Always a pleasure, Kai. And thank you for your efforts to educate your group. I know personally that putting on a conference like you're doing is analogous to herding cats. So best of luck with that. Uh, for those who can't make it to Kai's conference, the New Orleans conference has happened for 50 years. Great, great, great conference. By the way, if you work very hard, you can have fun in New Orleans. Um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, but at any rate, uh, Kai, thanks for the conversation. I look forward to doing it again. Same here. Same here, Rick. Thank you so much. And to everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. Love to hear from you. Put your comments down below. How are you positioning? How are you playing it? How, how are you chasing better? How are you trying to make money in this space? Given sentiment is muted. I'm really curious to hear from you. Rate the conversation down below. Give it, give it a rating from 1 to 10. I do want to hear from you. And uh, we do appreciate any subscribers and any feedback. And of course, likes to this channel. Free way to support, of course, is just by hitting that subscribe button. Thank you so much. We'll be back with lots, lots more. Thank you.